Greetings. My name is Arzu Osanlu. And I'm Kabiri Robinson. Thank you so much for joining us. We are coming to you from the University of Washington's Simpson Center for the Humanities. We welcome you to our Sawyer Seminar on Humanitarianisms, Migrations, and Care Through the Global South. With the support of the Mellon Foundation, this year-long comparative study of humanitarianism seeks to decolonize the rhetoric of humanitarianism by examining the histories and practices of care for forced migrants that have developed outside of the global north. This seminar is grounded in a set of theoretical concerns about the traditions of care and cultures of hospitality in parts of the world that are responsible for hosting the lion's share of the world's refugees. Indeed, some 85% of refugees seek shelter and remain in the global south, primarily in Muslim majority countries. We seek to move beyond the global north as the primary locus of study of humanitarianism and to emphasize instead experiences in and across regions of the global south with a particular focus on South and Southeast Asia, the Middle East and Africa. Over the course of the seminar year, we compare the conceptual categories that organize humanitarian practices and illuminate how values beyond those of the Western enlightenment constitute suffering, practices of care, and who or what qualify as worthy of that care. Today's event is the second of three in the theme Comparative Humanitarianisms. Here, we continue the work of decentering the West from ownership of humanitarianism by asking what other humanitarian logics shape when and how communities provide care to forced migrants. Our speakers ask us to explore a new global humanitarian project as one founded on diverse practices that recognize human suffering, the labor and principles of care, and the material and affective expressions of caring. They invite us to examine the ethical systems, logics, and rationalities that underlie everyday practices of humanitarianism across cultural and religious traditions in the Global South. And we are delighted today to welcome professors Amira Mittermeier and Sienna Craig, who have conducted extensive research in Egypt and the Himalayas, respectively. Their presentations examine the dynamism of non-Western humanitarianisms. They ask us to reflect on the ethical grounds from which humanitarianisms emerge and to examine why and how we privilege certain understandings of care and compassion over others. How they ask and uh, how they ask us to recognize an ethic of care driven by divine inspiration and how do spiritual practices organize unique capacities for helping others. Our colleague, Goju Burju Ege, a dissertation fellow for the Sawyer Seminar, will be the moderator of today's question and answer session. And we now turn to her to introduce our speakers. Thank you, Kabiri. It is a great pleasure to welcome our invited speakers, Professors Amira Mittermeier and Sienna Craig, who will speak on ethics of care in Egypt and the Himalayas. Amira Mittermeier is Professor of Anthropology and the Study of Religion at the University of Toronto and the author, most recently, of Giving to God, Islamic Charity in Revolutionary Times, published in 2019. Sienna Craig is Associate Professor of Anthropology at Dartmouth University, Dartmouth College, and her most recent book is The Ends of Kinship, Connecting Himalayan Lives Between Nepal and New York, published in 2020. And our discussant is Christian Kovatescu, the Sawyer Seminar Postdoctoral Fellow. Christian is currently working on a first book project titled Disasters and Solidarities, the Transnational Remaking of Crisis Socialism. We are very, very happy to have Amira, Sienna, and Christian with us today. Uh, would you like to say hi to our participants? Yes, thank you so much. It's so great to be here and I really look forward to the conversation. Likewise, it's a real pleasure and an honor to be here with all of you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Also from my end, I'm delighted to be here. I'm looking forward to this great conversation. Let me begin by thanking the organizers for this invitation. I'm excited to be part of this conversation 
That being said, I fit into this conversation somewhat uneasily. The Sawyer Seminar, as you all know, is concerned with humanitarianisms. Now, my last book was about an Islamic ethics of giving, but I don't usually place this ethics under the label of humanitarianism. In fact, I explicitly call it non-humanitarian. And I want to explain to you today why that is the case. To give you a quick overview of what I will be talking about, I want to begin by briefly recalling some critiques of humanitarianism. And in particular, I want to bring out the human in humanitarianism and lay bare some of its limits. When the human is the horizon and the only actor we see, what do we overlook? To decenter the human, I then take you to Egypt to get us to think about practices of care that foreground God. So I'll offer two examples that are both key sites in my book, and I will ask what drives the giving here. Stepping back, I then suggest that the kind of giving we see here is best understood as triadic, meaning that God is a key player. And last, I'll circle back to the question of what this means for humanitarianism. So let's first briefly talk about humanitarian reason. There are a number of critiques out there that you might be familiar with, and I just recall three briefly. First, Didier Fassin and other have, others have noted that humanitarianism rides on a mobilization of empathy rather than a recognition of rights, which means that it can erase or efface questions of justice. Second, humanitarianism in theory has a global reach, but as critics point out, in actuality, it works through exclusions, meaning that not all suffering moves us and not all lives count equally. At the same time, and this is a third critique, the invocation of humanitarianism, so particularly, again, this global appeal, the idea that we are all united by our shared humanity can become, become the ground for military action. For Talal Assad, military humanitarianism is not a perversion of genuine humanitarianism, but simply another articulation of its impulses. So these are important critiques to keep in the back of our minds. And they raise the question of how, what, how else forms of care might be organized beyond the horizon of the human. The human stands at the center of this ethos, literally and in practice. In Arabic, the closest translation we have is in Sanea, here too, El Insan, the human, takes center stage. So again, what are alternatives? Before I turn to my examples of non-humanitarian giving, it's important to say that, of course, Islam and humanitarianism are not incompatible by nature. They are, of course, compatible. Scholars have thought through non-Christian and non-secular genealogies and trajectories of humanitarianism, and this has included thoughtful accounts of Muslim humanitarianisms, for instance, in the work of Basit Iqbal, Jonathan Benthel, and Til Mosulansky. Others like Mona Atea and Chris Taylor have written about a neoliberalization of Muslim forms of care and about how zakat or almsgiving has been turned into a development tool. So all that is to say, Islam, of course, is not a static tradition. It's not a sealed of tradition. That's by definition anti-humanitarian. But what attracted my ethnographic and analytical attention during my research on charity in Egypt is a different form of giving that isn't about helping the poor help themselves and that also isn't about compassion. It's rather a form of giving that involves God as a key player. So here I want to introduce you to two sites that figure centrally in my book. The first site is Sheikh Salah's Khidma. So this is a former army employee, retired, a widower. He lives at the outskirts of Cairo and he takes the subway every day to come to this back alley in the Saida Zainab neighborhood where he rents a small apartment. And in this apartment, he spends his day cooking and then he goes over to the mosque, the Saida Zainab mosque and distributes the food at the mosque to people who tend to be very poor. Some of them are people who are passing by or who are visiting the Saida Zainab shrine, but many others are regulars and they include homeless people and a good number of street children. 
This space, this practice is called a khidma, which literally means service, and it builds on a Sufi tradition of hospitality, offering shelter and food. So why does Sheikh Salah do this every day? He says he's called upon by God, and his giving is orchestrated by Sayyid Zina, who's the Prophet Muhammad's granddaughter and is buried in the shrine where he distributes the food. So Sheikh Salah is connected to this invisible realm, the Barzakh. But this doesn't mean that he's out of touch with the world around him. He's in fact quite down to earth. He has strong political views. Um, he believes that to overcome poverty, we need government intervention. He thinks that we need to teach the poor to become more responsible. So he can be quite judgmental and he doesn't necessarily feel bad for the poor. But in his practice, he gives every single day. So he almost gives despite himself. He cannot but give because God gives through him. He's directed by God. And he's at the same time giving to God. So he believes that we owe to God and giving is a way of making up for our debts and shortcomings. So Sheikh Salah acts a form of care, but I suggest that caring for those in need isn't necessarily the same as caring about those in need. Precisely because it's not humanitarian, this kind of giving doesn't rely on compassion. The khidma is in fact about responsibilities, duties, debts, about rights, including the Quranic right of the poor, haq al-faqir, meaning that the poor are entitled to a part of our wealth. The khidma is also not about overcoming poverty or ending suffering. It's simply about those who show up, those who extend their hand. Sheikh Salah embodies what I call an ethics of immediacy. Here you see another khidma, this one in Alexandria. Again, those who show up get food, no questions asked. Um, and the woman who runs this particular khidma is the, the person who ended up on the cover of my book. Now, of course, the daily giving in these kinds of spaces unfolds in a context of extreme social inequality. Let's recall here that the Egyptian uprising in 2011 quickly grew into a call for social justice and literally for bread, responding, so it was responding to a widespread, uh, to widespread corruption an unequal distribution of wealth and high rates of extreme poverty. While the Egyptian state offers some social welfare programs, much day-to-day -day support in Egypt comes through informal channels be it neighborhood networks or the kinds of spaces such as Sheikh Salah's khidma that you just saw. So this giving, this kind of giving is central. It allows people to get by. The people in the Saida Zainab neighborhood know they can rely on Sheikh Salah every single day, regardless of what's happening in the political sphere. Now also regardless of COVID, Sheikh Salah continues giving every day. He just now hands out the food in bags instead of serving it in metal bowls. So that you don't think that people like Sheikh Salah are exceptional and marginal Sufi figures, I want to now turn to my second example, another one of my field sites to suggest that a non-humanitarian orientation figures also in organizations that follow a more mainstream Islamic logic. So here you have Risala one of Egypt's biggest charity organizations and one that's run, driven by volunteers. The founder of this organization sometimes uses a, a more secular language. He speaks of wanting to build a strong civil society. And he in fact was inspired by seeing people volunteer in Canada when he was studying there. And he wanted to import the spirit of volunteering to Egypt. But since its founding in 1999, Risala has grown into a very large organization. And for the volunteers themselves, at least the ones that I've come to know most closely, the care that they enact is in fact deeply embedded in, a, in an explicitly Islamic, if not Salafi logic, and that's their own language. So they will explicitly contrast this Islamic logic with a, a, what they take to be a Christian one. So they will say Christians help out of love. We help because God told us to do so. Here you see Risala volunteers cooking in one of the organization's kitchens, 
they then pack up the meal and they head into one of Kairos poorer neighborhoods to distribute the food. When they do so, they understand this as consciously placing the meal into the hand of God. So they speak very explicitly about giving to God, about gaining divine rewards, about trading with God. They are explicitly and unapologetically selfish. They will say the poor don't need us, we need the poor, they are our gate to paradise. Now, what does this framing do? I'd like to suggest that it disrupts a human, human frame, be it a hierarchical logic. So of the donor giving to the recipient, which creates a kind of hierarchy, or taking into account Marcel Mauss's classical account of the gift, a logic of reciprocity, where social relations are being established through the exchange. I want to suggest that what we see here in the Risala can't quite be captured by the dyadic logic. We in fact have a third party here and the third party is God. Going back briefly to Sheikh Salah, the way the triad works here is that Sheikh Salah is a medium or a channel for God. What he gives are really divine gifts, they come through him. The volunteers inhabit the triad somewhat differently. Here we could say the poor, the recipients are the medium. In order to give to God, the volunteers need the poor. This is not an absolute distinction between Salafi and Sufi logics. In fact, we find both these orientations in both the spaces. What's important is that God is a central actor here. Here on the left, you have a gate to a yet another khidma in Cairo. On the gate is written, Allah Karim, God is generous. This is a reminder that everything that's given in this khidma is really coming from God. On the right, you have the very commonly used phrase, Alhamdulillah, all thanks belong to God. So again, the idea that all thanks belong to God, but also all things belong to God, and all the giving is oriented to God. The very logic of lila to God is one that I try to bring out in my book. Now, whether God is giving through you or you're giving explicitly to God, when God is the third party, this disrupts a human-human frame. So what does this mean for humanitarianism? One option we have here is to widen the term. So some scholars have suggested that we should highlight the blurry lines between different forms of care, aid, charity, development, and humanitarianism. For instance, Erica Bornstein problematizes the lines that are commonly drawn between, say, the education of an orphan and the act of giving to a beggar and international humanitarian aid. She notes that all these forms are linked through the concept of the gift. So putting these different forms of care into conversation uh, can lead to a widening of our frameworks. Works. Alternatively, we can think about how the practices I have described push back against humanitarianism which is a term that neither Sheikh Salah nor the Risala volunteers are invested in. So I'm interested in how this kind of giving decenters the human. The human here is not the key object of intervention. Again, recall that the volunteers give not to the poor, they give to God. And human sentiment or reason is not the key ground for ethical action. This is a giving that's not driven by the suffering of the other, but by a divine imperative. This is a giving that undoes the fetish of the human, that organizes humanitarianism. My point here is not to romanticize a religious logic of giving, but to consider once again, how it disrupts a humanitarian logic. And I do think that this is an important exercise because humanitarianism doesn't only claim to have universal reach, Again, the idea that all of humanity is its object. But it can also function as a ground for inclusion or exclusion in the very category of humanity. So that participation in a humanitarian or humanist logic becomes a measuring stick. So then instead of calling Sheikh Salah short-sighted, 
or reading the Risala volunteers as selfish or as lacking compassion, I want to take their giving as a place from which to think about the limits and blind spots of humanitarian reason. So in this sense, I see my brief introduction to Sheikh Salah and the volunteers as a small contribution to the larger project of rethinking humanitarianism by way of an engagement with other traditions of care, and particularly to the project of rethinking the human in humanitarianism. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Sienna Craig and I'm very happy to be here for this Sawyer seminar. Thanks to Kabiri Robinson and Arzu Osanlu, the co-conveners of the seminar, and also to Christian Capicescu and Caitlin Paolo for all of their really hard work to make this event happen under challenging circumstances. This slide provides an overview of my talk. First, I wanna introduce you to three specific events that have generated a humanitarian response. Next, I'll give you a sense of how these events shape my ethnographic understanding of what I'm calling Himalayan humanitarianisms. Then I discuss some of the cultural orientations that give Himalayan humanitarianisms their meaning and form. So the events. On April 14th, 2010, an earthquake measuring approximately 7.0 on the Richter scale rocked Yushu Prefecture, Qinghai Province, China. Although small when compared to the 2008 earthquake in Sichuan, this event devastated Jekundo, Yushu's prefectural capital. Official sources list the number of the dead at approximately 3,000 with about 12,000 injured, but unofficial reports put the death toll three times higher. The epicenter was in a sparsely populated nomadic region, but several important, important cultural sites outside of Jekundo, including Tibetan Buddhist monasteries, were severely damaged. The event also impacted local dams, it disrupted tourism and other forms of trade, and left many people in and around Jekundo living in tents outside of their destroyed or severely damaged homes for months. This disaster elicited swift state and international humanitarian response. President Hu Jintao and Premier Wen Xiaobao responded with support from the People's Armed Police, as well as personnel from neighboring regions. Individuals came from as far away to help as Shanghai, Hong Kong, and Taiwan, and the American Red Cross was also involved. The earthquake prompted donations of about 2 billion yuan from Chinese citizens, and it was marked by a national day of mourning. Nepal. The first major earthquake hit central Nepal on April 25th. It registered 7.8 and was centered in the center of the country in Gorkha district. Then on May 12th, a 7.3 event occurred in Sindhu Palchuk district further east, compounding Nepali suffering. That spring, more than 300 seismic events were recorded in Nepal. The earthquakes killed more than 9,000 people and injured more than 25,000. Among the other consequences of the first quake was an avalanche on Mount Everest, killing 22 people and making it the deadliest day in the mountain's history. Another avalanche exploded that same day with half the force of an atomic bomb across the mountain community of Langtang, killing more than 300 people, both locals and foreign trekkers. These earthquakes also impacted religious and cultural sites in the Kathmandu Valley. More than 2.5 million people were displaced, half a million homes were destroyed, and it uh, did a huge amount of damage to public infrastructure, schools, health posts, hospitals as well. Although more than $4 billion was pledged in international aid, the humanitarian responses to the Nepal earthquakes were fragmented and fraught, engendering examples both of excellent community-driven efforts to build back better, uh, and responses that exacerbated inequality across the affected regions of the country as a result of failed and uncoordinated governmental, NGO, and other forms of international response. Then we come to Queens and to the global moment that we find ourselves in. In spring 2020, the Queens neighborhoods of Jackson Heights, Elmhurst, and yes, Corona, were the hardest hit by sheer caseload in the U.S., in mid-April, these parts of Queens had a caseload of over 11,000, hundreds of fatalities in a population of around 600,000. These neighborhoods are among the most culturally and linguistically diverse 
on earth, including perhaps the largest concentration of Himalayan and Tibetan people outside of Asia. One of the first deaths in the city was that of Anil Suba, pictured here with his family. He's the guy on the right. Uh, Suba was a Nepali immigrant and an Uber, dri Uber driver living in Jackson Heights. Approximately 40,000 immigrants from Nepal, Bhutan, Northern India, and Tibetan areas of China, as well as the Tibetan diaspora live in these neighborhoods and other hard hit parts of Brooklyn. Many of these people are essential workers doing jobs such as nurses, health aides, and home caregivers for both the elderly and for children, as well as being drivers in the gig economy and grocery store workers. So you might be wondering how these three events that are distinct in time and place relate to my anthropological work uh, and the ways that I read responses to these events as Himalayan humanitarianisms. So to start off, I've worked with practitioners of Soa Rigpa or the science of healing, also known as Tibetan medicine for more than 25 years. And I've been eager to understand how such practitioners respond to crisis, but also how their capacity to respond is or is not recognized by state and local governments, as well as by global health and humanitarian efforts and outfits, which tend to privilege biomedicine. I've explored this issue in the context of Tibetan medical responses to Yushu, uh, the Yushu earthquake and Tibetan medical health camps uh, run in Nepal in the weeks and months after the quakes of 2015. Together with colleagues, Barbara Gerke and Victoria Sheldon, I've considered what such Soaripa medical camps occurring in India and Nepal tell us about a global politics of compassion in the context of local health needs and priorities. Other elements of the work I'm presenting here build on my long-term research on migration, identity, and belonging between the Nepal Himalaya and New York City. It's the topic of my new book, which was just released in October. Um, but also this builds on collaborations with colleagues at the Endangered Language Alliance, a New York City-based nonprofit, and linguists and anthropologists at the University of British Columbia. Our community-driven research is focused on language diversity and immig immigrant life as it connects to literal mapping projects, an analog map of the languages of New York City, which you see here, that's now being transformed into a digital language mapping platform. So we were poised to respond when COVID hit. Over the past six months, we've documented lived experiences of Himalayan and Tibetan New Yorkers navigating the physical, mental, and economic effects of the coronavirus through audio diaries in 10 Himalayan languages, virtual ethnographic interviews with frontline workers, community leaders, and patients, and efforts at the intersection of language documentation and public health to understand how this community can be rendered epidemiologically invisible in many ways in the wider context of immigrant New York, even as their community-based humanitarian efforts remain deep and significant, not just to their own community, but to other New Yorkers. This work has also included a focus on Tibetan medical responses to COVID and Tibetan and Himalayan understandings of epidemic disease. So what are some of the cultural orientations that have shaped understandings of these disasters and responses to them? This is an image of the grassland outside of Riga village, the epicenter of the Yushu quake. This tearing of the fabric of the earth is at once literal and metaphoric. Many Himalayan and Tibetan people consider us to be living in a degenerate age, a time of increased greed, strife, disease, social disruption, known across South Asia as the Kali Yug. In the case of the earthquakes, but also in relation to COVID, interlocutors link the occurrences of these events to this time of decline, including this mis the mistreatment of the environment by humans, from disruptions or pillaging of sacred geographies and deities of place for the sake of development efforts like mining, hydropower, or roads, to behaviors of physical and or spiritual defilement that can lead to epidemic disease. In other words, a range of cultural narratives acknowledge human culpability in relation to things that might otherwise be read as natural disasters. At the same time, there exists a basic cultural recognition stemming from Buddhism that to be human is to suffer. We live in the jaws of impermanence, moving through cycles of birth, life, death, and rebirth in samsara, cyclic existence. The three poisons of ignorance, attachment, and aversion are part of being sentient, 
Even so, we all contain the capacity for liberation. Buddhist teachings entreat us to make the most of our lives as human beings, generating merit toward our next life, practicing compassion, and heeding karmic action. In addition, though, across these quite different moments of crisis, there's a recognition that politics matters, that life circumstances matter. In Nepal, the 2015 earthquakes occurred while the, uh, while the government was putting forth a new constitution, which in turn sparked protests that led to a five-month blockade of Nepal's southern border with India. This, in turn, exacerbated the humanitarian crisis of the earthquakes by blocking things like food, building materials, and medicines. For many Nepalis, such political infighting and government ineptitude was seen to be commonplace, part of a legacy of slow violence, zones of abandonment, and the disasters of everyday life to which Nepali people must adapt. In contrast, the Chinese government's response to the Yushu earthquake was swift and strong, an exercise in disaster relief as a display of state sovereignty. While the humanitarian aid granted to Tibetan residents in Yushu was appreciated in the short term, the destruction wielded by the earthquake then facilitated the total recreation of Jeet Kune Do in ways that aligned with ongoing state efforts to develop Tibetan grasslands through urbanization and resettlement schemes that many argue are in the interests of state control of Tibetan populations rather than the survival or respect for Tibetan lifeways on the plateau. And then there's COVID. I won't take time explaining how and why our nation's response to the pandemic has been so fraught. We're living it. What I will note as we look at the words of a Tibetan nurse working at a Queens hospital is that many in this community were surprised that the US was so woefully underprepared. The other lesson that was quickly assimilated by Tibetan and Himalayan New Yorkers in the face of COVID was that this pandemic had laid bare the fault, time, fault lines of inequity in this country based on race and ethnicity, as well as types of employment, immigration status, housing conditions, and more. So across these disparate locations and events, how did people respond? One way has been through the marshalling of medicines and other forms of protection, along with the use of biomedicine and the embrace of public health measures in ways that draw, though, on Soadigpa knowledge and practice and on Buddhist frameworks. In Yushu, Tibetan physicians not only set broken bones and treated wounds, but also gave patients medicines and meditative practices to calm the heart mind. In Nepal, Amshi, uh, which is the word for Nepali, uh, Tibetan doctor uh, in Nepal, Amshi were concerned about unqualified foreign biomedical volunteers that they had seen buying Tibetan medicines with no knowledge of how to prescribe them, but then taking them to places where they were providing humanitarian relief. Knowing the harm that this could do to patients, but also to the reputation of Tibetan medicine was one of the motivations for planning their own humanitarian responses in the form of camps. In both Yushu and Nepal, Tibetan doctors responded with amulets and blessing cords from prominent religious teachers. These are forms of protection against both spiritual and physical harm, including airborne disease. The amulets, which are basically like aromatherapy, were important also during the SARS epidemic in China in 2002-03, and they've been circulating widely during COVID. Nepali Amshi brought food and tin for shelters to areas that have been disregarded by state or international humanitarian efforts. And in COVID New York, many of these same efforts were deployed by Tibetan physicians. Creative public health messaging circled between Tibetan regions of China and diasporic populations in South Asia and North America to make sense of the novel coronavirus and to turn toward forms of protection that blended public health messaging with culturally salient symbols and practices, like the incorporation you see here of the goddess Tara into directions about wearing a mask. This is a picture of a monk in Amshi from Mustang, Nepal, engaged in rituals uh, with local lamas, as well as community members in Langtang, the place that was destroyed by the avalanche. This humanitarian act is focused not on addressing material needs only, but also what we might call psychosocial support, especially honoring the dead. 
Rituals were also performed for, to appease upset deities of place, a recognition in this mode of humanitarianism that the external world, what we might call the environment, not only maps onto sacred geography, but is also related to the well being of humans who live and die in these places. The earthquake in Yishu highlighted the importance of roles that Tibetan doctors and Buddhist practitioners played in humanitarian response. Tibetan physicians were on the front lines of emergency care, even as their institutions were being systematically marginalized in the process. After failed efforts on the part of prefecture and national authorities to import ethnically Chinese grief counselors, who didn't speak Tibetan, to provide trauma therapy to locals, the role of Buddhist practitioners in helping to acknowledge suffering and mitigate grief through ritual practice was eventually condoned by the state. Tibetan monastics were also allowed to do the work of sky burial and mass cremation. In accounts of conventional humanitarian missions, issues of burnout, PTSD, and other forms of trauma are often discussed as part of what happens to people who spend years of their life responding to disaster. This makes sense. And yet for many of the Himalayan and Tibetan doctors and monastics who responded to the Yushu and Nepal earthquakes, they spoke not of burnout, but rather of benefit that came to them by participating in humanitarian response. These were opportunities for deepening spiritual practice and earning merit toward their next life. In New York, while many healthcare workers we interviewed were certainly pushed to points of total exhaustion and anxiety, they spoke about their, the intersections between their medical and spiritual practices, turning to meditation and Buddhist ritual as a way to combat their own fears and approach patients, no matter their ethnic background, with renewed compassion and purpose. In Nepal, participating in medical camps allowed Amshi to see firsthand some of the inequalities at play in the lives of their fellow citizens. Although these camps were not overtly political, they fueled efforts to lobby, both for recognition of Soaripa within Nepal's Ministry of Health and for improved health services in underserved areas. Parallels exist here in how Tibetan and Himalayan healthcare workers have become more fully aware of the impacts of structural racism and socioeconomic inequality on health in their corner of immigrant America when responding to COVID. One of the earliest examples of collective community action, in fact, uh, in response to COVID was the formation of the urgent Nepali aid network for COVID-19 in the first days of April. An estimated 500 members of the Tibetan Nurses Association of New York and New Jersey organized and deployed resources for healthcare workers and general community members. COVID-related hotlines were set up to combat fear and stigma, as well as to provide translations of public health messages in relevant languages, along with guidance for doing things like signing up for unemployment benefits. Tibetan physicians in New York consulted with colleagues in China and around the world to determine what they could do for COVID prevention and symptom treatment with Tibetan medicine. Others generated merit by cooking for frontline workers. Uh, in the picture you see here, that's happening. More than a thousand meals were served to hospitals, NYPD and the fire department. But people also delivered groceries to those who were sick and donated money toward the purchase of PPE. Important figures in global Tibetan Buddhism such as the Karmapa who's pictured here, and local lamas alike, both in North America and in Asia, pivoted, offering virtual ritual practice through platforms such as WeChat and YouTube to those who were scared, grieving, or dying alone in hospitals. This was also occurring within a milieu of increased anti-Asian racism. So finally, as a way of considering the frameworks offered by Himalayan humanitarianisms, informed as they are by Tibetan Buddhist ways of being and knowing, I offer this picture of a Nepali Amshi and monk making ritual offerings at a temple in Kathmandu after having been in a village, primarily Hindu village that was devastated by the April 25th quake, making offerings on behalf of the dead from that village. I also highlight a quote from one of the Tibetan physicians in New York City, whose experiences are represented in our COVID diaries. It is impermanence all the way down. Thank you. Thank you so much for this uh, wonderful um, opportunity to uh, listen to our two speakers and who have offered such wonderfully rich and fascinating talks. So thank you very much for this. It's been really inspiring.
Um, and before we go into the minutia of your research, I would like to take a brief moment to sharpen up uh, with the two of you, Amira and Sienna, some of the central questions that guide our quarterly theme. And I ask you to talk about what kind of conceptual work humanitarianism as a category of analysis, as a lens, as it were, can do for us. And here I'd like to invite our audience to think with, uh, with us about what might be the benefits and drawbacks if we employ this term uh, to study different locales in the world, and sometimes arguably very different sets of ideas, practices, human relationships, and social arrangements. Um, and one of the main problems that often arise, and I'm sure the audience can relate, and this in fact came up in both uh, talks, is that the practitioners we study rarely invoke the term humanitarianism in their work. Um, Amira, in your talk, for instance, you unpack for us uh, relationships of giving to God that you call non-humanitarian. And Sienna, you point to culturally salient signs and practices in the Buddhist tradition that only uneasily fit the common, commonly expected language, ideas, and practices of humanitarianism, certainly in the West. So my question goes to the nuances that might be lost in translation as we rely so heavily on the term of humanitarianism. Do you see a risk that this concept might do more to obscure and perhaps misapprehend practices of care in, in the Global South than to render them legible and as productive sites for comparison? I'm, I'm happy to say something. This, I mean, I find the whole question of comparative humanitarianisms in a way you're all framing the project so exciting because it, it kind of pushes us to ask precisely those questions. What's at stake in emphasizing difference and particularity and what's at stake in using this wide and broad umbrella term? Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to this attempt to decenter the West and to show that um, there are humanitarian-like practices also in the non-West or the global South and in non-Christian contexts. Um, and one could certainly look at how humanitarian uh, vocabularies are taken up also in places like Egypt. So I'm thinking the Muslim Brotherhood or the Egyptian Doctor Syndicate, they would take up that logic and the very vocabulary. Um, but as I said in my talk, um, in my context at least, I find that uh, humanitarianism can obscure what's going on precisely because it sneaks in certain assumptions, especially the emphasis on suffering, the emphasis on compassion, which is something that my interlocutors often would reject. They're not acting because they're compassionate, they're acting because they're giving to God or God asks them to act in this way. So um, for that reason, I'm, again, to be true to my research contexts, I tend to um, want to preserve the difference and really follow their vocabularies because um, I think it opens up more interesting analytical ground for me and it, it's truer to their own understanding of what they're doing. And again, be because it also, I think, can help us to think a little bit about the limits of humanitarianism, the, the, the limits of the human as a horizon or even the social as a horizon. So this is kind of my, my take on this question. Thanks for that, Amira. I, I agree with your read and I really like the ways that our two talks and approaches actually quite complement each other, um, but do it um, from or, or approach this question from different angles. I think um, for me, these questions about the limits of the term also relate to audience. Who are you talking to? Who are you trying to talk to? Um, and, and how or why does this matter? So um, I, I also really appreciate in Amira's work, um, and I've tried to do this in my own work, the deep attention to vernacular and to the ways that terms and practices relate to each other that may not have any easy analog um, in, in this term humanitarianism. And you know, in some ways adding the S onto that term is, is a sort of shortcut to try to um, address some of the issues, Christian, that you're bringing up, that this is not singular, right? Um, but that's also a sort of awkward English glossing into something that might not always fit. Um, and yet at the same time, I do think, at least for the interlocutors and, and friends that I that I work closely with, especially the Tibetan physicians who are fighting all the time for a recognition of what they do at all um, in the context of state or international um, understanding that um, 
to figure out a way to adopt a term that is recognizable and attach it to what they do can also be, um, you know, a form of, of strategic essentialism, but, you know, or a useful form of strategic essentialism. Um, the other thing I would, the other comment about uh, that I wanted to make is about suffering and compassion. Um, I really, again, appreciate Amira where uh, you're taking us with those comments um, and agree. And, and then at the same time would pivot and say that those two terms, again, in translation are, are really crucial to the communities that I work with. They're absolutely talking about suffering and they're absolutely talking about compassion, but not necessarily in the way that we might understand that that from um, you know, a Latinate root of those terms, right? Or, or, or a sense of what that means um, in, in relation to uh, self and other um, in, a, in, a, in a non-Buddhist context versus a Buddhist context. Yeah, thank you for these terrific um, answers. Uh, and I would just like to draw out s some connecting threads here. And I think uh, one of the great benefits of employing humanitarianism as a conceptual tool, despite all the uh, problems that it raises, um, is that, and, and I think this is something Amira pointed out in her talk, is that it can really spur unlikely conversations across disciplines and geographic areas that might otherwise remain elusive. Um, so as such, humanitarianism can bring seemingly disconnected forms of knowledge into one framework of, of analysis. And that is certainly something that we do have to appreciate. Um, and on this specific topic, there's something to be said about also thinking about the similarities in your two cases. So let me flip around my previous question and rephrase it. Um, because when I was watching your talks, I realized that at first glance, um, you seem to refer to starkly different contexts of need and attendant cultural pr practices of care. So again, Buddhist disaster relief and medical assistance in Siena's talk and an Islamic giving to others in Amira's presentation. And my thinking is that if what if we decenter or dislodge for a moment, just for a moment, the cultural sphere and the cultural meanings and narratives that these distinct societies have created around Khitma and Sovarikpa as the main focus of study? And instead, might we perhaps realize that these practices fulfill, in fact, strikingly similar social functions in both contexts? that constitute a collection of social repertoires of human collaboration that are almost universally recognizable beyond the specific cultural context. Um, so your practitioners, for instance, safe lives, they tend to the health of uh, those in need, they engage in basic welfare provisioning, they participate in local economies, and here I'm, I'm speaking as a historian of, of Eastern Europe in a socialist uh, period, and, and they fulfill uh, all the gaps left by the state uh, and, and market and other forms of social and economic organization. Uh, what are your thoughts about this? Yeah, I'll leave it at that. So, you know, you want to take it first? Sure. Um, so, uh, yes, I, you know, I, the, my answer or my initial thought is, yes, there are striking similarities. And when you look um, at the two practices from that really nice um, sort of overarching perspective, Christian, that you just gave, I think that it is worth asking, you know, what, what are the bounds of culture here to be, you know, to be, uh, speak of it perhaps in those terms. Um, uh, and um, yet where I'm left, I suppose, in, is thinking actually um, about Amira's wonderful shift out of a dyad into a, a triad or a, or a, you know, a cyclical set of relationships and how that actually might be another way to, um, to think about um, Shifting the frame, and at the same time, uh, and at the same time, not getting caught in the in only the cultural specifics, but looking at some of the the ways that these examples we're giving do still do the the work of disrupting some of the humanitarian uh, uh, the logics or the humanitarian reason that Amira so nicely gave us, you know, an overarching sense of in in her talk. Um, 
God might not be the frame in the Buddhist sense, but um, there are other non-human actors involved in trying to think about what's happening in in a humanitarian frame um, or a frame we might call humanitarian. And um, that I think does get us somewhere different um, than uh, with this conversation about what the concept humanitarianism uh, accomplishes or what the limits of that are, uh, then, then not recognizing that it, maybe it's not a dyad and to sort of ch fundamentally challenging those dynamics. So um, as, as opposed to only focusing in on, on sort of the, the, the versions of culturally specific manifestations of some of these perhaps more universal human uh, responses, though, of course, one can always, whatever, complicate that or question that. So I'll stop there. Yeah, I, I fully agree. I mean, the answer is yes. Um, the kinds of practices we've described fulfill certain social functions. And if you want to use that language, they fill certain gaps, um, whoever's gaps. Um, so I think um, that's a fully valid way of reading them. And like Sienna said earlier, it depends on who you talk to. And sometimes right, that's the best way of describing or thinking about what these kinds of spaces do or these kinds of practices do. Um, but I also, again, um, think that for me, the most exciting parallel is not so much that we see these social actors um, filling gaps and helping in various kinds of ways, but that we see that happening enmeshed with spiritual economies, right? So Sienna talked about uh, spiritual marriage that's accrued toward a future life. In my case, it's toward an afterlife. That's a parallel I find super fascinating to think about. Um, and I just want to add that I, when, I, when I try to take seriously these logics and imaginaries, it's not so much for me a return to culture or culturalist logic. It's actually, in my context, I think of it more as a taking seriously of the lift theology. And I think that's different. So it's not that the chitma is part of a symbolic order in this culturalist sense, but it's an orientation to God that I seek to describe that, that makes this practice something different than just what's happening in the visible social material world. And I think um, it's not a matter of, again, West and non-West or Global North, Global South. I think it's a matter of listening really closely to what actually drives people and what happens for them when they're engaged in various kinds of uh, modes of giving. So it's, in my context, it's a heavily religious language that's offered, but I think there are often multi-layered logics and relationalities are plain and they can get erased if we just take the kind of the economic output or the social effect of these practices as our focus. Yeah, wonderful, thank you. Um, and to close this discussion, I have one final question for you left that introduces maybe another level where we can compare and try to draw some interesting uh, connections. And, and I'm sure audience members watching this may have run into this critique as well and uh, have been forced into a defensive posture. At least I have made that uh, experience in my own work. And the critique goes like this. The work of lay people and non-professional uh, in the rich vignettes that you have provided is in fact often neglected and outright dismissed because as critics would say, these practices cannot mobilize the institutional capacities to scale up assistance like states or international organizations. So therefore, in that reading, neither Hitma nor Sovaripa would amount to a meaningful contribution to the welfare and well-being of the many. So now as you answer to this, I, I, I recognize that there is something to be said about capacity and that capacity should matter. But perhaps there are different ways of thinking about the role of non-institutionalized daily practices that may add nuance to this logic of large numbers and this institutional epistemology that is so pervasive uh, in the humanitarian sphere, uh, for sure. Um, so how would you respond to this critique? Amira, do you want to do this one first? Sure. Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, so this question of yeah, institutional capacity of scaling up. It's a question that really haunted me during my fieldwork, in part because I was doing much of this fieldwork in the aftermath of the Egyptian uprising, when there was, you know, the call for social justice and the dream of a different, better world. It was all around us. And so, you know, what can the Hitma say to this? Um, what can it offer? And so it's a question that stayed with me and that I, in fact, end my book with. 
because uh, in the end, I say the Hitma, in a sense, refuses to be scaled up. And I think in this lies its most provocative potential for us. Um, and this is also different from the other example I gave. I talked about the Risala and the Risala, at least the founder of the organization who's still the head of the organization, he dreams of scaling this up and he dreams of a day when the answer to the question where the next Risala branches, the next Risala building will always be, you know, head down the street and turn to the right and they will be everywhere and globally. But the Chitma is very different and um, it's very tied to the place, to the here and now. And it's very easily dismissed as a not doing anything, a drop in the ocean. But what it does is precisely refuse this um, turn to future horizons and to this question of institutionalization and really just sink into the here and now because it's connected to this question of God. Um, so it, it brings to the forefront relationality and dependency. That's what it enacts again and again and again. And that has to be done day after day after day. That can't be just scaled up and, you know, um, so... so this is again an example, I guess, of the parts that don't translate easily. But for me, they're again the places where we might want to stop and really think about what, you know, why they throw us off. And I think they offer good places for thinking. But so the, the yeah, so the chitma is provocative and not uh not being kind of refusing to be scaled up and to, to be institutionalized in my reading. I leave it at that. I really enjoyed what you just said uh, and and agree with it in my own way or from from my own perspectives uh, with the people that I work with. Um, I think that this idea of a refusal to be scaled up might also uh, link to uh, what I've seen or talked about in other actually contexts of my work uh, around scaling across. So not or or going deep in particular places. Um, so. Uh, instead of just saying, oh yes, you know, the solution is going to be to have Tibetan medical camps everywhere and, and you know, lots of it, um, is instead to actually say, no, part of our goal is to um, provide a deep form of care to communities that are that are part of us and that are also might be different than us in the case of a, you know, ethnically Tibetan frame, um, but to do so um, uh, not with the desire to get bigger, but to go deeper into experiences of suffering in particular places. And, um, and at the same time, there can also be a, a sort of a, a tugging in the other direction, again, in relation to this issue of recognition for labor and recognition for expertise. Um, and yet I think that part of what um, the dynamics that I work with depend on is a kind of um, sense of what makes the work efficacious in the first place being a, about a high touch approach as opposed to a high tech approach to uh, humanitarian outreach or to human outreach, maybe we can say. The other thing I would add, and again, really um, appreciate and agree with Amira here, is the is the link to place um, and the and the sort of daily unfolding of what a place needs um, as being central to what. Um, some form of humanitarian action might look like. And again, that very much is tied to, uh, again, to, to build on Amira's wonderful phrasing, the lived theology of particular parts of the Himalayan uh, Buddhist landscape or worlds. Um, and you know, how that translates to Queens is, an, is another interesting question, but it does translate. Um, and I guess the, the other thing I would say is that, especially in contexts like Nepal, there are so many examples of how large institutional efforts fail and fail and fail and fail, that that's another way of sort of countering this critique is to say, yeah, but, you know, there was there were four billion dollars on the table and none of it, you know, so little of it got to where it was supposed to get to. And and I think that's actually, uh, again, a, a strong ethical position as well as an empirical position to argue for these these non scaled up uh, approaches. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And with this, I think we'll launch into the Q&A and Virtue, you'll take it from here. Thank you, Amira, Sienna, and Christian for a very, very insightful conversation. We have received a lot of interesting questions and I will try to pick common threads and bring them to your attention. Well, our first question goes to both of you, actually, and it is about the idea of normal. So the question goes, 
I wonder if you could say more about the idea of crisis as a context for these case studies. Political, spiritual, or economic crisis all seem to run through these cases. But is this contrasted to a sense that there is a normal that has been lost and maybe could be regained or should be worked toward? So this is a question for both of you. Thank you for the question. Um, I think it's a really interesting one. And um, uh, I don't have an easy or simple answer for it. I think in, in uh, the three case studies that I presented, there is clearly, uh, I would say, a sense of, of a acute occurrence um, uh, that people are responding to that does contrast with aspects or elements of how they imagine their everyday lives. Um, and yet at the same time, there is this sort of overarching sensibility of, uh, you know, um, impermanence on the one hand, um, and also this uh, sense of, of living in a time that is itself defined by different forms of instability. And so I think there are degrees of normal um, that people are accustomed to, as well as degrees of what I called slow, the, you know, building on Dixon's work, the slow violence or sort of the disasters of everyday life that people become accustomed to navigating. Um, so to use a, you know, an overused uh, medical metaphor, it's sort of this distinction between acute and chronic um, uncertainty. Uh, and how and how people navigate that into relation in relation to what they might call their normal life. Um, yeah, it's a great question in my context as well. Um, and the current moment, of course, is understood, I think, globally as a crisis. And Sheikh Salah, whom I introduced you to, thinks of COVID as within his kind of theology. So it's a divine punishment because we've all been too selfish and haven't been taking care of the environment and so on. Um, but even though it's a divine punishment, importantly, interestingly, he still gives every day, right? Because that is his job. Um, but so um, at the same time, he's an interesting person because he was giving during the Egyptian uprising and then, you know, the Muslim Brotherhood period and now CC, it doesn't matter so much what's going on politically. Um, even socially, he just gives day after day. Um, so it's not really driven by a sense of um, responding to a particular crisis, but it's again the very ethics of giving that he embodies. Um, that being said, I, 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 I do have many nostalgic accounts from many interlocutors, Sheikh Salah included, about how people used to care more about each other in Egypt and now everybody's so selfish. So yes, they need these spaces of food distribution far more urgently. But ultimately, I would say, and this is something I also had to grapple with, um, there's not a normal in the sense of um, imagining a society where there is always mutual care and there is no poverty, because life is a trial in this Islamic context, right? So, and, and there is inherently suffering and there is poverty. So I always ask my interlocutors at some point, if they can imagine a world without poverty, without the poor, but because they need the poor, as I said, right, to give, it's kind of inherent to their own piety and their own relationship to God. And ultimately, I would say the the, the overarching sense is that, that the, the poor will always be there, poverty will always be there, right? So it's not a kind of utopian or nostalgic engagement with a current crisis. It's more um, uh, a certain uh, attitude toward life and the afterlife that, that I think drives this. So um, this is the normal, this is the everyday, regardless of what gets added on in terms of COVID or what kind of regime is in charge. Thank you so much. So now I think I have to pick one question for Sienna and one question for Amira, unfortunately because of time limitations. So the question for Sienna is about human culpability. So it goes as, as you mentioned in your talk, the Himalayan and Tibetan humanitarianisms expose the human culpability in disasters that lead to humanitarian crisis. How do you think the religious slash spiritual essence of these approaches to human in relation to nature disrupts the human centricism of conventional humanitarianism? That's a really nice question. And I could say, I could answer it with Amira's talk. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the, um, I'm, I'm really struck uh, here by some of the parallels. Again, even though the framework of, of, uh, of God is different, um, 
so many of these narratives, um, including the ones, Amira, that you were just talking about, um, uh, are, are shared in some way. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that it, that this idea that human action has the capacity to act in these very particular ways on both human and, and, and other human and other forms of sentience and, and, um, including the sense of a living landscape, um, is something that, uh, I always find, um, deeply instructive. Uh, and I feel like I've learned a lot as a, as a human being from that perspective, um, over time. Um, but I do think it does, um, it, it raises really interesting and complicated questions about, um, uh, you know, what we humans are doing to cause different forms of crisis um, and where that culpability lies and then what we do about it, right? So a road building exercise, for instance, is a really interesting one to think about. Uh, you know, many of the people that I work with don't want to not have a motorable road. They want one. But the question is, how does that road get built? What kinds of um, uh, obligations are met to the to the non-human or to the more than human universe or uh, or sense of being in place, in order that that road doesn't have to be uh, doesn't have to cause further crisis, right? And um, uh, in the case of the earthquakes, you know, again, um, there were similar logics at play. Uh, even as people were also talking about tectonic plates and things like that. So it's also to say that these are both and um, uh, epistemological frames, not either or epistemological frames. I think many of the people I know and work with um, hold these things equally and sometimes, you know, are confounded by them and, and struggle to try to reconcile um, you know, different ways of understanding why something is happening um, uh, and what their culpability is in that space. But there is also definitely this sense that, you know, we have gotten more greedy, we pay less attention to each other, we, we care less, um, and that that's part of why this suffering is being enacted on or through us. Um, even as this thing we call nature also has its own um, will and its own um, life force or life forces within it. Thank you so much. And now, uh, unfortunately, this will be our last question and it is for Amira. So this is a kind of question I really like, it's about tensions. So the question goes, can you speak how the conceptions of gift and duty slash right of the poor come together or might be intention for your interlocutors in Egypt? Um, good question, difficult question. So, so the concept of right of the poor, Hakal uh, Fakir, is, is a Quranic concept that I draw out uh, in, that basically says the poor are entitled to a part of our wealth. I draw that out in part in the context of this, of this larger conversation also because um, it pushes back already against this understanding of humanitarianism as shifting from rights and justice to morality, right? It's only, it's, 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 it's no longer a justice-based discourse in practice. Rights get pushed aside. So I'm trying to say with that, that this understanding of, of um, rights is very much at play. Um, and duty ties into that um, because... Um, I mean, if you want attention, there's a tension, of course, between duty in a, in a social sense, right, a social obligation, and then duty again to God, um, again to return to Sheikh Salah, who is admittedly one of my favorite interlocutors. Um, for him, the duty also stems from the fact that we owe to God um, because of how our own shortcomings. For instance, if I have a job and I get paid for my job and I don't work and I kind of waste time, then I owe that money to the poor via God, according to him, right? So that debts that always exceed the social. Um, so, so this is the duty and, 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 and rights and justice logic that's at play, right? Um, and then the gift, um, um, I mean, to, to bring it back to the gift of Marcel Mauss, if you want to go that route, right? The, the, the very possibility of, of justice comes back in, in his own understanding of the gift and obligation that's built into the gift. So I think these things um, can come together and they come together 
in, um, not to say there are no tensions and contradictions in my interlocutor, Sheikh Salah is full of contradictions, but I think what's so interesting about this giving is that it leaves space, um, this gift-like giving, that it leaves space for notions of justice, rights, and duty, and indebtedness. I leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now uh, I thank you. And without further ado, I am turning over to Arzu to conclude this event. Yes, uh, thank you all very much. This has just been such a uh, provocative and inspiring event, really. Um, so we wanna thank Professors Mittermeier and Craig. And of course, all of you are continued uh, audience and listeners for this these events. And we look forward to hosting you in two weeks on February 18th at 3.30 Pacific Standard Time, when we will welcome Professors Basit Iqbal and China Schertz, who will extend this conversation on the ethics of care in other humanitarian logics as we consider the role of divine suffering in Islam and charitable gifts in Christianity. As a reminder, today's webinar will be available on YouTube shortly, and you can find a link to it on our website, humanitarianisms.org. There, you can also find our full program and learn more about this Sawyer seminar. And those of you listening live today will receive an email inviting you to join our mailing list. And please don't hesitate to contact us should you have any further questions. On behalf of all the organizers, we want to thank you and have a great evening. Good night.